thanks so much for joining us today. The war in Ukraine hijacked President Biden's domestic agenda in his State of the Union, Union address. Last night, the president vowed to push back against Putin by closing off American airspace to Russian flights and increasing economic reprisals. Then President Biden turned to the crises here at home, claiming progress in fighting the pandemic and touting low unemployment figures. Tara Mergener has more on the president's speech and the response to it. The speech was in the works for months, with the president originally planning to rally support for his domestic agenda and massive social spending plan, but with the Ukraine crisis, a change in focus. Putin's latest attack on Ukraine was premeditated and totally unprovoked. He rejected repeated, repeated efforts at diplomacy. He thought the West and NATO wouldn't respond. He thought he could divide us at home. The president's primetime speech, a delicate balancing act, testing his leadership on the world stage as Russia's war on Ukraine rages on. Biden criticized by members of both parties for not standing up quickly enough to Russian President Vladimir Putin highlighted the battle between democracy and autocracy, announcing new efforts by his administration to push back. We're coming for you, ill-begotten gains. And tonight, I'm announcing that we will join our allies in closing off American airspace to all Russian flights, further isolating Russia and adding additional squeeze on their economy. As a tribute to Ukraine, some members of Congress were blue and yellow. The ambassador to Ukraine for the U.S. sat with the First Lady in the viewing area. Stand and send an unmistakable signal to the world. The president's speech comes with his approval at a dismal 37 percent, thanks to a lingering pandemic, soaring gas prices and record inflation, helping tank Biden's popularity as November midterms loom. Despite all of, of his spin and rhetoric, you know, our inflation's at a 40-year high. We've got gas prices at a seven-year high. Um, you know, crime is rampant. Um, our southern border is an absolute disaster. Sadly, uh, every one of these things is self-inflicted. But Biden touted progress in the fight against COVID, low unemployment, and introduced his unity agenda. This is our moment to meet and overcome the challenges of our time. And we will, as one people, one America, the United States of America. Republicans, however, aren't buying it, criticizing the policies of the president and his party, as pointed out by Iowa Governor Kim Reynolds in the GOP response. It feels like President Biden and his party have sent us back in time to the late 70s and early 80s, when runaway inflation was hammering families, a violent crime wave was crashing our cities, and the Soviet army was trying to redraw the world map. As the situation in Ukraine develops, it is still too early to know how Americans will assess Biden's handling of the Russian invasion. But new polling shows only 42 percent trust him to make the right decisions. On Capitol Hill, I'm Tara Mergener, CBN News. Well, there were times last night where I actually thought that, you know, he was uh, tacking to the, the mainstream. Uh, he was going to the middle of America saying we can't defund the police. If anything, we have to fund the police. Uh, we need law and order. The current lawlessness that's in our cities uh, shouldn't stand. I wish all of that was being done uh, two summers ago, but here, here we are, and, and, you, and you're hearing this in a speech from the president. The other thing I want to critique uh, is that on the immigration policy, uh, if he wants to pass an immigration bill, a comprehensive immigration bill, well, he's had control of the lower house, the Congress and the Senate uh, for over a year. And so uh, what are you waiting for? You, you've got the ability to do it. Uh, so why aren't you pro putting forward the proposal for your own party to pass instead of just talking about it in the speech, the need for it, uh, why don't you get something done? All that said, we need to unify as a nation because what Russia is doing, and I hope we can, we can do that, I hope Ukraine uh, allows us as a people to come together and realize our domestic disputes pale in comparison to what's happening internationally, uh, what's happening in Ukraine, what's happening in Taiwan, what's happening with Iran. 
We need to come together as a people. And again, a house divided can't stand. But if we have respect for one another and we can try to say we're unified, that we are the United States of America, well, then we can have success. In other news, the Russian advance on Kyiv is stalled, and some troops are reportedly surrendering. Others are attacking Ukraine's civilian population. Ephraim Graham has more from the CBN newsroom. Ephraim? Gordon, there are reports parts of that 40-mile-long Russian convoy of tanks and military vehicles are running out of gas and other supplies. Facing unexpected resistance from Ukrainian forces, the Russian military is now targeting civilians. Video from northern Ukraine shows rescue teams running into burning homes after military leaders say Russian missiles targeted a residential neighborhood with a hospital nearby. At least five people were killed when Russian forces fired on a television tower, also hitting the city's main Holocaust memorial. Ukraine's President Zelensky remains defiant, a Ukrainian official claiming an assassina assassination attempt by a Russian hit squad was foiled. Meanwhile, a senior U.S. Defense official says some Russian units are surrendering without a fight, citing low morale caused by shortages and lack of training. A humanitarian crisis is brewing in western Ukraine. More than 700,000 people have fled to neighboring nations. Many of them are passing through the city of Lviv. As CBN's George Thomas shows us, Christians there are making sacrifices to assist these refugees. It's a wrenching scene playing out across Ukraine. Husbands like Pavlo forced to say goodbye to his wife and two-year-old daughter Maria as they boarded a bus here in Lviv bound for Poland to escape Russia's invasion. It's terrible because, because actually it was so unexpected and nobody was prepared to, to, to this situation. More than 600,000 people have fled so far to neighboring countries. And so many of them are arriving here in Lviv, in the western part of the country. And I mean, you just look, they're, they're coming with just a suitcase, uh, a duffel bag. And uh, my understanding is that uh, Ukrainian men are not allowed to board the trains from Kyiv to Lviv. Anybody between the ages of 18 and 16 uh, is not allowed to, to, to get on the train because uh, the government says they need them. They need them to fight. We will have the volunteers and we will do what we can do here in Lviv. Not far from Lviv's main train station, three ladies who escaped the fighting this week and never knew each other before this moment. She's um, some sausage. Found shelter in Anastasia Mochar's tiny apartment, which she shares with her brother. I don't know how long I'm going to be here because it's really hard to make plans. Anna Tikhanchenko is from Kharkiv, Ukraine's mm -hmm. second largest city where Russian forces bombarded City Hall Tuesday. It's really hard to listen to the news and see the photo of neighborhood. The places where I hang out, to see them destroyed is so sad. Like so many residents here in Lviv, 22-year-old Anastasia Mochar, a Ukrainian Christian, decided to open her home to the young ladies even though she didn't know them. This is totally normal for me, because I was raised in a family where our home was open to other people. We were always helping people who were going through difficult times. This past weekend, Mochar's church turned all available office space into temporary rooms for refugee families. There will be a lot more refugees coming. We are not sure what's going to happen next, but the Christian community here stands ready to help, provide shelter and anything else we can do. The United Nations is warning the ongoing exodus could grow to as many as 5 million in the weeks ahead. George Thomas, CBN News, Lviv, Ukraine. CBN's Operation Blessing is sending a disaster relief team to Ukraine's border with Poland to help with the flood of refugees. They're bringing water filtration devices, hygiene kits, and solar lamps for those staying in camps. 
The team includes a medical doctor and plans to set up medical clinics as well as coordinate distribution of food and water. Operation Blessing also continues to work inside Ukraine, distributing food kits, bottled water, and generators. Gordon, back to you. If you want to be a part of this relief effort, it's real easy. All you have to do is call us, 1-800-700-7000. The reports from our team inside Ukraine. We've been operating in Ukraine now for about three decades. Uh, since 2014, the invasion of Crimea, we've been operating in the eastern part of Ukraine. All of that has become very difficult because of the war situation. One report from our office in, in Kyiv is that we're just struggling to stay alive, that we have to move constantly uh, and, and respond to troop movements. And so you can, you can we're, we're just trying to survive. So in response to that, we're dispatching our international disaster relief team to the border of Poland to help the refugees who are coming out of Ukraine. So if you want to be a part of this effort, give us a call, 1-800-700-7000. Just say, I want to give to Operation Blessing Disaster Relief Fund. Uh, you can write to us at CBN Center, Virginia Beach, Virginia. Just put uh, Disaster Relief Fund on the memo line of your check. Or you can text now, OB Crisis, to 71777. Or you can go to CBN.com. There's a place where you can designate your gift to International Disaster Relief. Either way, do it now. Let's be a help to those who are, are fleeing war in Ukraine. 1 800 700 7000. Well, here's a story that'll keep you up at night. There's a back door to our country's electric grid, and China holds the key. While most of the, the focus has been on network security, experts warn that a major attack on our critical infrastructure could be imminent. Caitlin Burke reports on the threats that's been largely ignored. Substations like this one are in almost every city nationwide. Most house transformers, which are a huge part of getting power out to you. The larger they are, the more critical. Transformers have been called by many people the Achilles heel of the electric grid. Transformers take voltage sent by power plants and convert it to a level that can be distributed. Essentially, they keep electricity flowing at safe levels. While the U.S. electric grid consists of thousands of them, the high voltage carriers make up less than 3%. Even so, they're responsible for transporting 60 to 70 percent of our electricity. These are 500 ton, 20 feet tall, multi-million dollar machines. They're also custom made in China. And experts like Joe Weiss say while the U.S. is busy securing its networks, China has the ability and opportunity to sabotage the equipment we rely on them to manufacture, essentially creating a back door into our electric grid. What they have is the ability today, they have their finger on that trigger today, that they can take over that transformer and everything that transformer supplies coming in or going out. This is a very big deal. Weiss, an engineer and independent consultant, says this is no hypothetical warning. The U.S. has already discovered backdoor electronics in a Chinese-made transformer. It was that discovery that led then-President Trump to sign an executive order in May of 2020 banning the acquisition, importation, transfer, or installation of any bulk power systems from foreign adversaries. The discovery also led to something that's never happened before. The next large transformer from China that arrived at the port of Houston was intercepted by the U.S. Department of Energy and taken to the Sandia National Laboratory. Remember, this is a 500 ton, multi-million dollar machine. So there was a utility missing. Llewellyn King is a journalist who's been covering the energy field for decades. When he approached the Department of Energy about the missing transformer, he was met with a veil of silence. No comment is uh, to me very much a comment. It says there's uh, smoke and there must be fire. So not, not only do our domestic utilities not know what's being found, our closest allies, who also have Chinese-made transformers, do not know what has been found. There are more than 200 of these large Chinese transformers in our electric grid today. One accounts for 10 percent of the power going to New York City. Another supplies 18 to 20 percent of the power going to Las Vegas. 
And yet, the U.S. is focused on our cyber networks, something China has already proven it can bypass. Instead of trying to hack all of these networks and everything else to try to get in, all they did was put in some hardware that will allow them to send signals. So instead of sending a voltage signal that's coming from a voltage sensor in that transformer, they can send a signal from Beijing into that piece of equipment. In November of 2020, an Arctic blast froze 40 percent of the Texas electric grid. Millions of homes and businesses were left without power. The outages lasted only days, and yet more than 100 people died. Back in 2012, then-Secretary of Defense Leon Panetta warned a room full of business leaders about the scope of a true attack on the U.S. grid. The collective result of these kinds of attacks could be a cyber Pearl Harbor, an attack that would cause physical destruction and the loss of life, an attack that would paralyze and shock the nation and create a new profound sense of vulnerability. Weiss says the question is not if this kind of attack will happen, but rather, will we even know it was a cyber attack? What a sophisticated attacker will do, and Russia and China, even Iran and North Korea now fit in this, they will make a cyber attack look like an equipment malfunction. He points to Stuxnet, the U.S. cyber attack that took out a fifth of Iran's nuclear centrifuges. For a year, an entire year, the centrifuges were being destroyed. The people inside could hear those centrifuges screaming. They never even thought that cyber was the problem. They simply viewed it as a systemic design flaw. Experts like Weiss stress that our critical infrastructure is made up of engineering equipment, and it will take a partnership between engineers and cybersecurity defenders to truly protect it. Our workforce is not trained to address this. The people that understand the equipment have no training in cybersecurity. The people who understand cybersecurity are not trained to understand how an electric grid or you know, a pipeline or anything else works. This backdoor threat from our adversaries applies to all of our critical infrastructure, not just the grid. Much of that same equipment is used in all other industries. So it's a weak spot for the electric industry is just as much a weak spot for every other industry. The parts that make up this critical infrastructure are also old, and as we've seen in Texas, susceptible to extreme weather events. So whether it's malicious or unintentional, if these systems go down, it will be months, if not years, before we get them back, making us truly vulnerable. Caitlin Burke, CBN News. Well, this has been going on for years. I've heard from industry leaders for a long time the amount of uh, intellectual property that China was stealing and, and doing it quite openly. And our government was literally turning a blind eye that we're so dependent on trade with China uh, that we can't seem to break. But they're being very intentional here. So there's a reason the Department of Energy took that transformer and was trying to break it apart to see well, what did they hide in here? There's a reason the, the government is now waking up and saying, well, Chinese cell phones are probably not a good idea for Americans. And this is a huge problem. So I will amen what President Biden said last night. Let's turn to Made in America and look at all of our critical infrastructure, whether that's our water, our electricity, our fuel, our pipelines. Um, I live on the East Coast. We went through a fuel so shortage because of a Russian cyber attack on a uh, pipeline. Uh, we need to realize we're vulnerable to this, and there is no reason that we need to buy this equipment from a foreign power. Uh, let's have it made in America so we know that it's secure. Ashley. Jocelyn James was living with her uncle to escape her alcoholic dad's abuse. Then her uncle died in a car crash. And before long, Jocelyn wound up on the nightly news as her county's most wanted felon. 
On October 3rd of 1995, he was headed home to watch me cheer for a homecoming game, and he never made it home. I was very mad at God that he would take someone that was so good to me out of my life who I needed. Jocelyn James had been living with her uncle Wade when a car accident took his life. He had given her safe shelter from her father, an abusive alcoholic. When he would whip me with the belt, I felt just helpless. And I mean, like it hurt so bad that like I just wanted him, I wanted him dead. More than giving Jocelyn an escape, her uncle showed her something her father never could. I longed for someone's love because I would see families out with their their mom and their dad and and I just didn't have that. He was a godly man and he just loved me. With her uncle and his love gone, Jocelyn fell into a deep depression. At 16, the once popular cheerleader and A-plus student quit high school and started partying and drinking. I didn't care about life. I didn't care about anyone. I was just mad. I was hurt and I knew when I drank that I didn't feel any of that. By the time Jocelyn was in her early 20s, she was married, working at a manufacturing plant, and using meth. The only times she stopped were the three times she got pregnant, all which ended in miscarriages. It hurt my heart more than it hurt me. I didn't know if there was something wrong with me, if there was something wrong with him, um, or if it was just God. Two years later, there was a bright spot. Jocelyn would give birth to a daughter and three years later to a son. By this time, she and her husband divorced and she had gone back to using meth. Then, during a routine checkup, doctors discovered she had ovarian cancer. While it took six surgeries to remove the cancer, it also put her back on the path to addiction, this time to prescription painkillers. It completely changed my life. It literally numbed everything in me. When the prescription stopped, she started getting opiates from people at work. Over the next five years, she would fall deep into addiction, going from pills to shooting up 16 times a day. Opiates like takes full control of your whole body, like your mind, your body, your, your, your soul. Over the years, Jocelyn would lose everything except her children. She was arrested numerous times as she resorted to selling drugs and stealing to support her habit. By 2012, the ravages of addiction had taken over as she now weighed a mere 95 pounds. Still, she was in denial. I'd lost all self-respect, respect for anyone else. I went from being an, a functioning addict to someone who couldn't even, couldn't even wake up if, if they didn't have their fix the next morning. In November of that year, with nowhere to turn, she and her children moved in with her ex-husband. She was watching the news one night when her picture came up as Franklin County's most wanted. I was tired, I was over it, I was sick of living that life. The next day, she turned herself in and was eventually found guilty of a number of crimes, including forgery and drug dealing. She would serve six months of a possible 10-year sentence, and the only way to stay out of prison was if she completed a long-term rehab plan at Lovelady Center. After one month there, her caseworker asked her what she could do there that would please God. And that was the moment. I just kind of scooted out of the chair onto my knees, and I was like, I got to do things his way. I, I surrender all. I don't want to live this life anymore. I don't want this heart. I don't want these eyes. I want to be transformed. And I was. I asked him to, to forgive me for all the wrong that I'd done, everybody that I had stole from, to, to please just forgive me. I felt like I was looking at, at a new life, like I, like I was looking at a newborn baby who is, who's got a chance at life. That day was my new chance at life. Afterward, Jocelyn says through two months of prayer, God healed her heart and her mind and totally delivered her from her addictions. I've never relapsed, I've never used a drug, and that is nothing but God. 
and he did it for me, and, and he, can, he can do it for anyone. In time, Jocelyn was also able to forgive her father. Forgiving my father felt good because there was no, no more anger there. Um, and that's what, that's what God does for us. He forgives us daily. Today, Jocelyn is newly married with a blended family. She and her husband, Greg, help others who were just like her find true freedom in Jesus through their ministry called The Place of Grace. Jocelyn knows that God can take any mistakes of your past and make you brand new. When you turn your life over to the Lord and, and you totally surrender, He does feel that for you. No one can love you like Jesus loves you. God's the only way. He's the way, the truth, and the life. He's the only way. Amen and amen. Hear that truth today, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. If you just watch that story and something is, is moving in your heart and you feel drawn to that, but you're not sure what to do, and you're asking the same question Jocelyn asked while she was in the rehab facility, what can I do to please God? If you're in a desperate situation right now, you're not sure where to turn, you're not sure what to do, who to talk to, but you're asking that same question in your heart, the answer is simple. Just come to Jesus. He is waiting with open arms to receive you. He, you were created to live an intimate relationship with your heavenly Father who loves you who knows every hair on your head, who knitted you together and formed you in your mother's womb. He loves you. And there is no chain, no addiction too strong enough for the love of God. The word tells us in Romans that nothing can separate us from the love of God. And Jesus isn't asking you to be perfect, to be totally blameless before coming to him. No, he is just asking you to come as you are. And in that surrender, in that heart posture of Lord, I surrender my life to you. Then you become blameless and spotless, not by anything you've done, but by what Christ did for you on the cross. So friend, if you want to come to Jesus today, if you want to have a fresh start, just like Jocelyn did, what he did in her life, he wants to do in yours. All you have to do is say, yes, Jesus, I want you to transform me from the inside out. I want you to change my heart. I want you to change my mind from this day forward. It's a simple gospel, friend. It's not complicated. Just believe and receive the good news and your life will begin to change. Pray with me right now. Lord Jesus, I cry out to you. Alpha and Omega, Jesus, Yeshua, my Savior, I believe and declare that you are Lord. I believe, Jesus, that you walked this earth and you died on the cross for the forgiveness of my sins and the sins of this world. And I believe that you resurrected three days later and you sit at the right hand of the Father and you intercede for me. Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Today, I choose to turn from my wicked ways and to look unto you. I give you my life today. Free me from these, this bondage of sin, of addiction. Change me from the inside out, Lord. Cleanse and purify my heart. Cleanse and purify my mind. Today, I dedicate my life to you from this moment forward. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. And Father God, I just lift up my brothers and sisters in Christ who have just prayed that prayer. Holy Spirit, I pray that you touch them right now, Jesus, and they feel your tangible love and they are transformed from this moment forward. In Jesus' name I pray. 
Amen and amen. Friend, if you just prayed that prayer with me, I want you to do one more thing. Give us a call at 1-800-700-7000. Tell them that you just gave your life to Jesus. They will continue to pray for you and pray with you. And also they will give you um, some new resources that we have for you. It's called A New Day. And it's just gonna help you along this new faith journey. So give us a call, 1-800-700-7000. And welcome back to the 700 Club for this CBN news break. As Russia continues its relentless invasion of Ukraine, the rest of the world is rallying for peace. From prayers to protest all across the globe, demonstrators are demanding an end to the war in Ukraine. In the Georgian city of Tbilisi, to the citizens of Turkey, Germany, Spain, at the Philippines, and even Moscow, peace-loving Russians risking their own safety by publicly opposing the onslaught. Some place flowers at the fence of the Ukrainian embassy in Moscow, urging their leaders to leave Ukraine. There's a new film in the works based on the true story of the spiritual awakening in Southern California during the 1970s. The film is called Jesus Revolution and revolves around Pastor Greg Laurie, who sets out to redefine truth and ends up meeting a hippie street preacher named Lonnie Frisbee. They both connect with Pastor Chuck Smith, who opens up his church to other hippies and seekers. A great spiritual revival occurs at the church, leading to the Jesus Revolution. The film stars actor Kelsey Grammer and the chosen Jonathan Rumi, just to name a few. Filming begins this month. I want to remind you, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at cbnnews.com. Well, Brendan is an airman who serves his country, and he knows his wife's job is just as important. She's the one at home raising three children with another one on the way. This military family couldn't escape their massive debt until they got a visit from helping the home front. The heart of Central California includes beautiful views and sweeping scenery of Santa Ynez Valley. It's also home to Vandenberg Space Force Base in Lompoc. Operation Research Analyst Brendan is stationed here with his family. His wife, Star, is a stay-at-home mom. With three kids and one on the way, Brendan is quick to point out Star's job is just as important as his. My wife, hands down, is a rock star. I'm never worried about anything. I mean, she is the person that takes care of everything day to day. I trust her wholeheartedly. God has me right where he needs me, and that the job that I am doing, staying at home, helping to raise and teach the children, and making sure that things are taken care of, so that's one less burden that Brendan has to worry about. Living on an airman's salary with a growing family wasn't easy. They needed new items for the baby, plus school supplies and clothes for the older kids. However, their biggest financial challenge was thousands of dollars in student loans that would take years to pay off. The couple lived on a very lean budget, committed to paying off the loans as quickly as possible. The Lord does not want us to be in debt. Our main goal is to get out of the debt that we are in, that way we can you know, live a fruitful life and be able to help others. Right now, the situation may not be where we want it to be, but down the road, we'll be able to break out of the bondage of this debt that we have. Their pastor at Lompoc Four Square Church reached out to CBN's Helping the Home Front and asked if we could give the family some financial relief. Pastor Bernie Fetterman told them CBN was taking them shopping for the new baby and the older kids. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. And an even bigger surprise was in store. We're going to uh, cut your student loans in half. Yeah. God is always watching and he's always loving and he's going to bless you. And this is definitely one of those times, yeah. definitely. Then it was off to a shopping spree. Now that their student loan debt is cut in half, this military family is on the fast track to becoming debt free. So I definitely pray that Helping the Home Front continues its mission, the mission that you all have is one that is going to continue to help keep our military community encouraged to keep pressing forward with the goal of sacrifice for country. What a wonderful family, and, and I just love helping the home front. What we do, what we do together to help active duty military families. We need to recognize the entire family is serving 
when a parent or a spouse is in active duty. Uh, they go on deployments, they're away for long periods of time. Uh, there's usually a whole lot more month than there is money, and we want to help them. We want to let them know that we stand with them. So that's why we call it helping the home front. If you want to be a part of it, just join the 700 Club and say, yes, I'll, I'll, I'll join with tens of thousands of people that say, I want to make a difference in the world. I want to help people. I want to help people right here at home. I want to help people around the world. I want to preach the gospel around the world. I want to help people in Ukraine and Africa, India, China, Philippines, Indonesia, Latin America, where it's all possible when people like you say, yes, let's join. So if that's you, call us, 1-800-700-7000. How much is it? It's just $20 a month. Some can give higher levels. We have $40 a month. 1,000 Club is $1,000 a year. Whatever level you join, I want you to have this. It's my father's latest book. It'll be our gift to you for your pledge of $20 a month or more. So it's called The Power of the Holy Spirit in You. If you've ever wondered how my father got direction to start CBN and then sustain CBN and how CBN has grown over the years, it's all because of his prayer life and how the Holy Spirit would speak to him and my mother. They would get together. They'd pray in agreement. They would ask God for direction, and God would respond. The Holy Spirit would speak to them. This book will show you how you can have that same guidance in your life. You can get guidance and direction knowing that God is with you. He will bless you. He will prosper the work of your hands. I want you to have it. It's yours when you join. So call us, 1-800-700-7000. If you want to give a special gift to helping the home front to help our active duty military families, that's easy too. Just say, I want to give to helping the home front. You can give monthly or you can give a single gift. Uh, just write Helping the Home Front on the memo line of a check. The address is on the screen. Or you can go to CBN.com. There's a place where you can designate your gift there. Or you can call us, too, and say, I want to give to Helping the Home Front. 1-800-700-7000. Ashley? Nate is a walking miracle. Almost four years ago, he was thrown head first through the windshield of his truck. His next five hours were spent alone, bleeding in a ditch, First responders never expected him to survive because they ignored one critical factor, the miraculous power of prayer. And I could see that there was uh, somebody laying in the bottom of the ditch, and I assumed that he was probably dead from the looks of it. In the early hours of March 4th, 2018, 21-year-old Nathan Hedberg, a baseball player at South Dakota State, was driving home when he lost control of his truck on the icy roads. Police determined his truck rolled twice before ejecting Nate head first through the windshield. After Nate spent nearly five hours lying in the ditch, a farmer, Jim Bomberger, found him and called 911. She's, you know, said, check see if he's breathing, and I, I could hear kind of a gurgling noise. And I said, well, I think he's breathing. Nate had suffered frostbite, a fractured spine, and swelling of his brain. First responders didn't believe he would survive the 20 minute life flight to the nearest hospital. Medical staff contacted Nate's parents. I was awakened by uh, my cell phone ringing and it was the emergency room. Before I even got up out of bed, I went to God in prayer, telling God, you do what you choose to do and I will accept whatever you choose. I broke down uh, on my knees and I welled like I've never welled in my life. Terry and Lori flew from their home in California to the hospital in South Dakota. Lori, a nurse of 30 years, told the surgeon to be honest about Nate's chances. He said, uh, he's so unstable. If we did surgery to, to relieve the pressure on his brain, he goes, I'll kill him during surgery. He's like, there's nothing I can do for your son. And he told us at that time that he wasn't convinced that Nate would make it through the night. And I just said, God, I, I can't control it. I don't know what to do. Would you please heal my son? I put my hand over this surgeon as he's giving us this hopeless scenario. 
And I said, but you're forgetting one thing. And he's like, what? And I said, there's a God factor. Despite the prognosis, as word got out, the Hedbergs were inspired by the prayers of people from their hometown and all over the world. The news of Nathan's accident had gone viral, and uh, we had so many people praying for him. And that was uh, very amazing to me. While Nate was still in a coma, his older brother Justin sang Christian songs to him, and Nate's response was encouraging. A couple of nurses walk into the room, and they noticed on the charts of his cranial pressures and his brain was actually decreasing. And he would sing to Nathan, and the pressure monitors would come down to a much more acceptable level. It was precious. After a few weeks, Lori believed God wanted her to convince the doctor to take Nate off the ventilator. The surgeon reluctantly agreed. I truly believed God would raise my son, but the doctor didn't think he had the mental capacity uh, to breathe on his own. And when we extubated him, it's, it's pretty traumatic. And Nathan had the best cough. He literally rose off the bed coughing. Nate actually became alert and he said, I love you. We were all believing for Jesus to heal him. And that was like a miracle right in itself because uh, I know the doctors didn't expect him to go beyond the a machine. After several more weeks, Nate awoke from his coma. I immediately was shocked. I was just, I was just like overwhelmed with joy to see him moving, to see him speaking, even if it wasn't coherent sentences, like it was, it made sense. Like life was coming back to him. After months of rehab, Nate made a full recovery and returned to his hometown. Everybody from that small town just came running to see the kid that was dead and is now alive. When I went back, I mean, when I was walking around town, a lot of people just ran up to me and hugged me and was just crying and just thankful that their prayers were answered. And I just was so thankful. After all they've been through, the Hedbergs can't help but praise God for Nate's survival, healing, and the prayers that were answered along the way. This miracle doesn't happen to everyone you know, in the same circumstance, you know? And I know that God has saved me for something and I want to live up to what He wants from me. He was showing us, even in hindsight, that He was in control and that He was hearing the fervent prayer of those who are walking with Him. Every day I thank God for bringing our son back to life. I rejoice every day. God is absolutely in control. We can trust Him with everything. We can trust Him with our heart. All He wants is us to submit, to submit and trust Him that He is a loving Father. Wow, amen and amen. Yes, God is a loving Father. And here are my words today. King Jesus sits on the throne. He sits on the throne of whatever situation you feel hopeless about, you feel desperate about, it seems bleak, whatever the report is from, from the, the doctors. Believe the report of the Lord, which is you are healed by the stripes of Jesus Christ. It is by the death and resurrection. Yes, Jesus died, but he resurrected three days later. And it's because of that resurrection that we are healed. So receive that today, receive that for yourself today. And we've got some more amazing answer to prayer, miraculous testimonies. So let's go ahead and read those. This is uh, Timothy by email. He said, I'm a 700 Club member and frequent watcher. While watching on 2 22 so just last week during the word of knowledge, Gordon said, God is healing Timothy of sinus problems. So by name, God called this person out. I claimed this healing. Since then, my sinuses have opened and my foggy brain is gone. Praise God, the great healer. Yes and amen. Here's Paula from Miami, Florida. She had a chronic cough for over a year. The doctor prescribed cough medication and inhaler, but neither worked. While watching this show, Ashley gave a word of knowledge. Someone who is coughing has had chest pressure. The Lord is healing you right now. Well, Paula believed God. She called a few weeks later to say she's been completely 
healed. That's over after over a year. Doctors couldn't do it, but King Jesus, he can do it. He can do all things. Uh, listen to the prayer of that wonderful father in that story. And he's coming to God and he's saying, I can't control it. As a father, I know that's a desperate place to be. You know, as a father, you want to do everything you possibly can for your children. You want to make life easy for them. You want to make sure they have everything they need, food, clothes, housing, education, but especially healing. If they're sick, you want to do everything. You will move heaven and earth for them. Well, our Heavenly Father feels the same way, and He feels the same way about a thousand million times over. He came. He died. He was beaten by soldiers, and by His stripes, we are healed. We were healed. He did it while we were sinners, while we were running away from Him. He said, I still love you. I still want you back. I still will provide a way. Let's just rest in that. Let's rely on that. You know, when you think you have control, nah, realize that you can't control it. But King Jesus, he's got this. He's got your back. He can move mountains for you. He can heal. He can deliver. He can set captives free. And he wants to do it. The bargain has already been made. Let's just abandon ourselves to it and say, Lord, I rely on you. Let's pray. Lord, we just come to you. And for anyone who is facing an impossible situation, for anyone who has gotten an impossible diagnosis that there is no hope, there's nothing medically we can do, for anyone with a chronic condition, there's no medication, there, there's nothing that can be done, we lift them all to you and we declare over it, you are the God of the impossible. For with you, all things are possible. Stretch forth your hand to do miracles, signs, and wonders. For those with diseases that are incurable, infirmities that won't go away, situations that won't seem to change, we give all control to you, and we ask that you do the impossible and do it now in Jesus' name. Mm -hmm. Ashley, God's given you something. Yeah, I believe the Lord is healing cancer right now. So if you have been diagnosed or a loved one has been diagnosed with cancer, just receive the healing from the Lord right now. I believe someone was watching. Brian, you've been diagnosed with, you have cancerous tumors in your liver and your kidneys the Lord is healing that for you right now. Just receive your total and complete healing. You will go back to the doctor. Those tumors will not be there in Jesus' name. Uh, many people with brain issues, whether it's stroke or some kind of neural um, problem, electrical discharges, you're being healed now in Jesus' name. If you've been touched, give us a call. Let us know. 1-800-700-7000. Here's a word from Psalms. As soon as I pray, you answer me. You encourage me by giving me strength. God bless you on this Ash Wednesday.